Okay, now it's time to really pay for the dinner. You've got to listen to the lecture. Um, I've been working the Mullica shipwrecks for since 2015. I remember a friend of mine asking me to come back in the early 1990s. I said, hey, we're going to dive some shipwrecks in the river. You can't see a thing, but they're from the Revolutionary War. And I said, I think I'll pass. <laughs> and now I do that all the time. We're going out <clears throat> tomorrow morning to get some more images of the shipwrecks that are there. Um, because these are historic. They are the oldest shipwrecks in New Jersey, along with the ones you'll see in the slide presentation. Crossroad Creek, which is the other side of the state, those were, as Washington was leaving quickly out of Philadelphia, you remember like Fort Mifflin and all the battles that were fought there, they took those ships into the Crossroad Creek to try and scuttle them to save them from the British destroying them. Not all that much different than happened in the uh, Mullica River. So this presentation is similar to what I'm going to do for the State Historic Commission on Friday. Um, and it's a lecture I give my classes at college. Um, you've seen parts of this before. I've updated it a little bit with some new images. <coughs> Diving the Mullica is probably no different than you dipping that brick of tea leaves into a glass of water and expecting to see the bottom. <laughs> At least there are no leeches and bugs. There's some greenheads in the summer, but now we do it in the winter time when the, even the greenheads are done. Uh, but the wrecks are what's left of the British coming in and burning them to the waterline. They sank in the river, and there they stayed untouched for all this time. You, the nice thing about crowd such as yourselves, you know this history better than I do. But Chestnut Neck, one of those pivotal battles, you know, privateering was a big business, 1,700 privateer vessels up and down the U.S. coast. If it weren't for the privateers, there wouldn't be enough money to pay Washington and his troops. And most of the troops were farmers. They went to soldier because, yes, they wanted to get out from underneath the British. They still wanted to be paid, and it paid better than farming. But the, how do you pay for that? You steal from everybody else. <clears throat> the British were losing supplies. Privateers were really good at what they were doing. The insurance rates, inflation, were driving up the cost of goods. People in New York who were British loyalists or British citizens couldn't get the things the privateers were stealing from them. And this forced them to tell the British, you need to stop the privateering. <coughs> so history pretty common to you all. <clears throat> this map from 1777 came from the wall places, the New York Public Library. Great places when you really start to go looking and you have a couple of hundred hours to spare time. <laughs> and a lot of patience. Uh, and you know the right things to ask for. But this was the map that they used to attack Chestnut Neck. You see the inlet, it's marked the river as best as they could do it back 240 some years ago. Um, you would laugh at what it is now, but it was a major salt work for the Continental Congress, South Jersey. The forge Basto was up here at the forks, and that was where we wanted to keep that British presence from getting to at the time. <clears throat> the ten ships that were supposedly burned, we've only found three or four of them, um, so we're still looking for the other ones. But most of the merchandise went up the Mullica <clears throat> into the Bass and to Rancocas and all the other rivers by barge or by horseback or carriage to make their way to Philadelphia or to Morristown where Washington was wintering with the shrews. There are plenty of old shipwrecks in the rivers. I know I found some old barges from the early 19th century. No telling how many old shipwrecks are around besides just this small area of the Mullica. Excuse me. These are the three that are the easiest to find, the ones that are the most intact. Um, the fall wreck, 
was one that Stockton had found back in 2008. They said, oh wow, a shipwreck never did anything with it because they really didn't have a marine program. And nobody was trained to take a look at it. And it was just, just an old wreck. It could have been anything. The bead wreck is, all of these are on the National Register of Historic Places. But the bead wreck once looked like this. <coughs> Excuse me. Shouldn't have had dinner than talking. Mm -hmm. um, but it was sitting in the marsh. And as it was going through the tides and the river current flowing down, ocean coming in with the tides, it started to erode away. One of the worst things that happened to the shipwrecks in the river was when they rebuilt the parkway bridges and took down the Route 9 bridge. All of that stuff changed the drainage patterns for the marsh. And it affected the bead probably the most. The bead was in eight feet of water when I first almost stood up and dove it. Um, and interesting wreck, you know, your diving history, the Revolutionary War, now it's at 40 feet and it's slowly falling apart. It used to be as intact as these, but it's just environmental conditions. We thought about raising it up to save it, but then that would mean preserving wet wood. And for those of you who have wet basements, you know that's a challenge. And the state of New Jersey said, well, we'd like you to do it, but we're not going to pay for it. So Stockton said, we'd like you to do it too, but we're not going to pay for it. So they're staying right where they are. Um, but when you travel through the river, you're traveling over one of the first amphibious assaults in South Jersey. Turtle Gut being probably the first. But here, a fleet of British ships, 10 of them, came in to burn the town down. The town was built out of wood like all the houses were back then. The British left after a week. They were happy. They destroyed the ships. Not coincidentally, were their own ships, the prizes in the river. So they really burned their own ships. The privateers, the people of the town, came back a month later. They were back in business. <laughs> Enterprising Americans. <clears throat> so the idea is to preserve the history because even though there aren't as many wood-eating worms in the river as there are in other places, the wrecks are falling apart. This one's pretty intact. This is what the ship probably would have looked like. This is the last three feet for those of you who own boats. <clears throat> Think of the bilge, the place where you hate to go, where you drop the screwdriver or the nuts for something you were fixing, <clears throat> at the very bottom of the ship. That's the only thing left. It was burned to the water line. So what we're doing <clears throat> is taking some drawings and measurements as we dive. And I know the distance between my knuckles and my hands so I can lay it on the wreck and flip my hand back and forth to measure. Because you can see maybe one or two feet. You're in a fast moving current. It's like sitting in the bottle of a, a soda bottle or a cup of tea. But you're talking about the history of the Revolutionary War and how we fought that war. <clears throat> so I provide the information to the state. <clears throat> the state keeps it on file. A lot of the artifacts that we found are at the Maritime Museum in New Jersey. And before you leave, come up and take a look. I bought a few. Uh, I'm a trustee at the museum, so I can afford to take them out. <laughs> of course, I didn't tell them, but I took them out. <clears throat> this is a shiv. And if you have a wood on either side, this pulley would have the line that would raise or lower the sails or pull up something that they were doing on the boat. It's made of a wood called lignum vitae. We totally deforested parts of Brazil and the Caribbean because the wood's waterproof. I mean, this has been sitting in the water for 244 years. And you wouldn't know it. You can see the scratches. And this is... Um, the remains of a black glass beer bottle. You've all seen the antique three-part bottles. You, know, you can find them in auctions. Sometimes they're fairly inexpensive, maybe $20, $30. The good ones are fairly expensive. This is what happens when temperatures reach over 350 degrees. It turns that black-green glass blue, and it totally melted this bottle in its shape. <clears throat> the British torched the ships. And part of the state of New Jersey's requirement to make them historic was you had to prove that these were the ships the British burned. The bottles are the evidence. They melted. They only would melt at those temperatures 
and the black glass <coughs> would turn to this blue color. It's hard to date them. We know how many ships went past Chestnut Neck in 1777 because we could trace the ones that didn't get hijacked and showed up again in 1779. So we just did the math, and there are 33 ships that are unaccounted for. So out of those 33, some of them are in Chestnut Neck. There's nothing on the wrecks that says, I'm the Venus of London, probably the most famous. We did yesterday find a pewter spoon on one of the wrecks. Um, so we'll take that and preserve it and, and put it in the museum and hopefully it has a name. Because the Venus was probably that pivotal expensive ship that bought forty or fifty thousand dollars back in seventeen seventy eight as an auction prize in today's dollars, millions of dollars for those ships. So it's difficult to try and figure out what they were, the names, any more than the construction and where they were built. It would make no sense for the British to sail a 90-foot, two-masted schooner from England to the US. So they probably were built here. And we took some samples of the wood, all with permission of the state of New Jersey, by the way, because they didn't want to spend any extra time at some of the state's penal institutions. <laughs> but the wood that we took is, is cedar and oak, grown probably in Maine or New Hampshire. The same forests are in England, so yes, they could have been built there, but why sail across the Gulf Stream? Because the current of the Gulf Stream was just too fast for a, a wooden sailing ship. Let's see how good you are at history. Anybody know who was the first person to understand that the Gulf Stream was part of the reason why it was longer to sail from England to the United States than it was from the United States to England. One of the, probably one of the smartest original. Ben Franklin, probably. Who? Ben Franklin. Benjamin Franklin, right, good. He's the first one to draw a map and recognize that the uh, Gulf Stream was really slow bringing him back from France because the current was three or four knots. The sailing ship could do three or four knots. Can't buck headwinds very easily. So it took a while. In many cases, they had to sail down the coast of Spain, down through the Caribbean to avoid the Gulf Stream, and then hitch a ride on the Gulf Stream to go back up to New York or Philadelphia. So all of this is part of that history and how the ships were built. I wish I could put a name on them. But unless somebody left an artifact, which we hope maybe an engraving on the spoon, might be helpful. The sailors back then didn't own much. They had a bowl for their stew that was made on board. And they usually had their own spoon in addition to whatever clothes they had. So the likelihood that this spoon may be personal possession, have an engraving, might increase the chances of telling us the name of the ship. But the sailors didn't own much, but a spoon that's been preserved, and it's pretty well melted, but you can still see that it's a pewter spoon. Um, we're hoping you can tell something from that. We found some bricks on the full wreck. They're not the same size and shape and consistency of the bricks that you use for your houses now. So they were made back then, and it was part of the ship's oven part of the thing that they used to cook the stew that fed the crew on these ships as they sailed up and down the coast. So the artifacts, the state of New Jersey, like everybody else, you can't just say the shipwreck is historic, got prove it. The wood was charred and burned. The artifacts, the glass was melted. The construction of the ship was done with trunnels, so wood nails instead of iron or brass. All those things point to a ship made in the middle 17th century. The culprits, you know, the fact that they're in the river in the same place helps, but there have been lots of ships in and out of the river, and after a while, there were a lot of shipyards in the Molokou where the ships were built. So there could be anything in terms of ships there. So the Kramer wreck, right out front of Chestnut Neck Marina, you can see the construction of the ship, the keel inside the ship, where the masts are held in place and all the frames and everything are bolted to, just like that piece of wood that holds the roof together. 
the rafter that goes straight across your roof and all the eaves are attached to it. The same part of the ship here is where the bottom of the ship frames are attached to and then the masts would go in two little holes here and they would be surrounded by wood to hold them in place but if for some reason a storm or a cannonball broke them the crew could pull them out and take a spare one and put it back because if your motor broke down on your boat or your car, you call AAA or have a spare part to fix. If you lost your sail, you had to figure out a way to get to move the ship. You always had a spare at least to get you through. I point out the Kramer because it's closest to the marina. It's sitting on a ledge right where this white line is. It's been that way for a while. Eventually, it's going to fall off the ledge as the water current moves up and down the river. <coughs> and it's going to push the wreck into maybe an extra 10 or 15 feet deeper water. And when it falls off the ledge, like the bead wreck, it'll break apart. So the history of an intact wreck will be gone, even though the wreck itself will still be there. Here's what the marina looks like. You've probably all passed it on the water. It's still pretty much in the same spot as the old marina was in 1778. Here, a sonar trail. These black lines are the pilings in front of the marina. The sonar can't see through them, so it creates that shadow. The Kramer wreck is here, um, and it's a debris field. And if the river is bad to dive in, diving in front of the marina is even worse. Um, and it's in front of everybody else's property. And what are you doing in the water? Um, we haven't gotten a chance to dive there because I suspect that a lot of this part of the river is broken up pieces of some of the other ships. There should have been 10 remnants from the battle. Most of the accounts say that there were at least 10 sailing ships and maybe as much as 30 whale boats because Chestnut Neck was a big whale port back in the, the Revolution. We've only found three wrecks and just recently what we think is another one, but it doesn't look like the rest and it's really hard to tell. Uh, but this is a, a multi-beam, a dimensional look. Each one of the colors is indicative of the height of the seafloor and the wreck on there. So the deep blue is the deeper part of the river. The green ledge with the shadow there is that cliff that the wreck is kind of hanging off. And I suspect that the ladies who own the marina would just as happily see the wreck disappear. <laughs> and make their life easier because it's a historic district. They have to spend a lot of money on dredging permits to make sure it doesn't damage what archaeologists call underwater cultural heritage. This is your history. This goes back to your time. The wreck is an inconvenience for them as it would be for everybody. I mean, I spent a lot of time looking for shipwrecks in Greece and Sicily. And you can't put a shovel in the ground there without coming up with ancient civilization somewhere. You have to protect it. As much as it's a pain in the backside, it's your heritage. It's where we started. And this is really one of the more pivotal battles for the Revolutionary War. Lots of skirmishes in New Jersey. Um, this one didn't change the outcome of the war, but the privateers were the ones who essentially paid for the war. If it weren't for all of your families or your relatives and all the people who work with them, where would the money come from? I have a continental dollar that I found on a shipwreck off of Manisquam. It's the first coin that the Continental Congress minted instead of using everybody else's money. It's worth a lot of money, but the British found the mint and destroyed it because, hey, why not bankrupt the government? That's like something we do nowadays, probably. But the coin is invaluable. It's the interlocking rings on the back, 13 of them have each one of the colony's names. So in terms of a find, it's made out of pewter, and it's just, it's, more, it's worth more than the Spanish doubloon I have from a treasure ship. But it's that history, I probably never will sell it, just holding it says, here's our first attempt at independence, making our own currency. So all of this, this is the Kramer, the wreck is intact here, and all of this sawtooth kind of stuff 
Some of it is just the debris that comes down and gets stuck in the ridge and the river, but some of it are probably the wrecks that were moored at the dock when the British came in and torched the town. The trick is how much of them is real, how much of it is you know, some lumber that's carried downriver or upriver. We haven't found a location where the zebra was burned and destroyed as the British left. So all that history is still yet to be found. A lot of the bulk of the wrecks, I think, are here. If nothing else, a 30, 40 foot whaleboat that would have been taken out to get the whales would have probably been part of what was found in the marina. And speaking of which, um, Vicki Cantrell is a member of the, so she has a house at the end. And I got a call once, this floated up in their lagoon. I'm sure you've all heard that story. It's in the book. Um, but it's the worm shoe of an old sailing shoe. And a worm shoe is like for your boats now, you put a zinc on so that the electrolysis in the water doesn't dissolve your propeller and propeller shaft and have to buy a new one. Well, for a wooden boat, the worm shoe sat in the mud all the time and it would be that sacrificial zinc made out of wood that the worms would eat so it wouldn't eat the rest of the ship. And that's what this is. The nails came out, they were all hand hewn. So more than likely what floated up in, in the lagoon is a piece of those shipwrecks. Helps me believe that this is part of what that history was. And how many of you have been there or at least heard the story by now? It's an old shipwreck. It's the very bottom. I had a wooden boat for years. I put a sacrificial piece of wood on the bottom of my keel because at low tide it sat in the mud. I didn't want the worms to eat holes into the wood where I'd have to fix the leaks. They were no different back then. And a lot of the practices we do now have their basis of what people did back then. So it's a bead wreck on the wedge. Um, this is the keel, the part of the boat that would sit in the mud that all the frames would be attached. Uh, a few frames left, they're all falling apart. In this case, the shadows tell the difference. This is a piece of wreckage. The shadow is where the sonar passed underneath, so the shadow is kind of different from where the piece of the wreckage is. In a place here, the shadow is kind of bowed, so it's looking underneath. And what this tells me is that the river is slowly eroding this away. And when they took down the Route 9 bridge, all that construction, they made a 60-foot hole in the middle of the river, which is really good for fishing, by the way. But it changed the drainages to the marsh, altered that flow of tide and river coming in, and it's starting to erode the marsh away. I mean, it's a moving river. It's going to change. It's, it's a living thing, really, how that sediment moves up and down over time. So the wreck will eventually fall into the river. But this is one of a hundred ships on the National Register of Historic Places. Its history is for at least New Jersey, the oldest shipwreck in the state. <coughs> this is what it was carrying. This is how it got its name, the bead wreck. Because when we were diving it, you would find all these beads in the sediment. And they were used for trading with the Indians. They were used as decorations. And to make a glass bead, you melted silica and you wrapped it around the stick and let it cool until it formed either a bead or a tube. And you could color it with dyes or the kind of silica that you had to make the beads. But there's no way to tell what the name of the bead red was, but it found so many beads. Easy enough, that's the bead red. The fall red got its name because uh, Professor Bill Fole, my predecessor at Stockton, who was teaching archaeology, he found the wreck in 2008. He named it after himself. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let me tell you, I found one last year. It's called the Mag wreck. <laughs> I may not have a fortune, but at least my, my memory will go on until somebody finds the real name of that wreck. Um, but the bead wreck, we found an anchor. Now, the anchor, and part of the book, part of the reason for writing the book was I worked with a couple of uh, graduate students from Monmouth University, Dr. Richard V. Um, he's more land 
I'm underwater, uh, so his students wanted to do marine archaeology. Uh, an unnamed university, not Stockton, but has a field station in the river on its own somewhere, um, accidentally brought the anchor up in a drift. They asked me not to tell them. <laughs> Because they called me up and said, we got this on a dredge, what do we do with it? I said, well, you can put it back or we can preserve it. They didn't have the money. I talked stock them into giving me $10,000 to preserve it. But there's no guarantee it's from the time. Like even ships, back then the anchors were more angular and they would break because the force was against an angular surface so the torque would pull it apart. It wasn't until maybe the early 1800s that they realized a curved anchor would be stronger. But there's nobody who has ever found the definitive book on who made that first anchor. When did they change from the V-shape? And the ancient Greeks, Romans, used big stones where they drilled holes into and they used those as anchors. I mean, people were very creative. Pretty sure it's not but there's no reason to believe that it wouldn't. It's in the exact spot that the beat was in. So could it have been deposited 20 years later? Yes. Could somebody have made this anchor? Well, this is what the forges do. <coughs> Not only Batstow, but all the other forges in every other state, they made the iron, pig iron, to make this stuff. So who's to say that somebody didn't do it? There's no book that I've ever found. There's a British book on anchors for British naval ships that sets the standard for anchors, but not for commercial private boats. So this could be, could, it's dated to about that time, um, but good practice and the sense of liability more than anything else, we just have to say we think it is. And it's at the field station, we do preserve it. Uh, some of your members, Norman, and a few other people are who helped along the way are part of the plaque to preserve the anchor, and it was a project for my students. It took three years. We had a big fiberglass tub underneath the field station porch, and I had 20 amps of electrical current going into it for three years with a sign that says, please don't stick your hand in your head. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, it was the only thing that killed mosquitoes. <laughs> the tank was full of dead mosquitoes. <laughs> but the electrolysis changed the cast iron to something like magnetite, which didn't decompose as readily, didn't rust. How many of you have an uh, iron skillet to cook on? You know, when it gets rusty, you can put it in a, a water, a five gallon bucket, and run electrical current to it, it gets rid of the rust. I mean, I scrape it off with a scrubby and then throw a little olive oil on it, and the rust goes away. But to preserve the anchor, too much olive oil. So the electric current, along with a basic solution, adding soda ash to the water over three years, it stabilized the anchor and actually changed from cast iron to magnetite. It still rusts. I still need to paint it, coat it, but it won't decompose as quickly. Here's the bead wreck. This was the drawing. Um, they didn't have Google Earth back then. Um, 1975, it was pretty much intact. Remember, it just looks like a skeleton because it was burned to the waterline. But between 1975 and 1985, the wreck is half broken apart. And it's falling apart even further in the other drawing. This is what the wreck looks like on the marsh. The anchor came from this spot in here. When I picked up the anchor, they gave me a location, the university in question. And you know, I took a look with some art to try and imagine what that is. And the river, I have where all the wrecks that I've seen in the river in some way, shape, or form. And how we asked ask my students to do it, I'll show you in a few slides, but this is my wreck. Not sure what it is yet, but it's in the Malacca on the far side of the marsh from where the full wreck is. It has a shape similar to the other ships. It doesn't look like a ship, but it's not somebody's Chris Crab. Um, it could, eventually they came up with the idea, you use the triangle and that would be how the ship would stand on anchor during the pain change of tides. And the students got pretty creative. They all passed the class, by the way, with A's. <laughs> 
So we figured out that's where we would put the shipwreck. So it made it easier to narrow the search down, even though we've sonar scanned this river many times. The foam wreck is here. Mag's wreck is there. The bead wreck's here. The Kramer is the red ones. The yellow ones are places we haven't found anything. Although five years ago, there was some kind of wreckage just next to the Parkway Bridge. I can't find it anymore, so I'm guessing that it got buried by the sediment. But this is how we started to do the search to find what the history would be. Now with the sonar, we do a mosaic, and here's the rubble, the Kramer wreck. There's nothing here, but there should be. The bead wreck is being affected by the drainage of these marsh canals. And then there's a little unknown thing here. The full wreck is one of the more intact ones. And then the new wreck is not too far away in the middle of the river. And the rivers change course lots of times. Google Earth is a great thing because at least until when they had satellite data, which probably wasn't until the 60s and 70s, you can go back in time at one spot on Google Earth and see what that spot looked like and changed over time. Again, only in, until there were satellites. <clears throat> but we've got a pretty good idea of where everything should be. We've looked through here and haven't found anything, but the people who lived there, worked there, this was their life, you wouldn't have those ships anchored too far away from where you can get to them. They were money. They were that bankroll that they were financing the revolution with, it was their livelihood. I found copies of the letters of Mark, you can get online the archives. Various captains had different arrangements. 10, 20, 30 percent was your take. Not a bad living. You know, the Venus of London was one of the more expensive ships of the time. It's said to be sold for 40,000 in British currency back in 1778. That's for to $10 million now, big money. $40,000 was big money back then. So this was a good business in addition to the captains getting in. I don't like to use the term pri pi pirate, but everybody does. They weren't, they were legally allowed to take ships. Oddly enough, the letter of mark that I have that John Hancock had signed uh, from Princeton Archives specifically mentions that they would not be allowed to take any ship from the country of Bermuda. So I'm guessing we vacationed there back in the 1700s, <laughs> like we do now. But there were some exclusions. Everybody else was open game, just like our ships were open game. Our ships were even open game for other privateers if they violated the rules. So all of this was a business that made people's lives. And in between, they went fishing. They knew the rivers and how things changed. <clears throat> Which brings us to the two battles that I've gotten involved with. I've managed to, over the years, work on all the historic shipwrecks in New Jersey, starting out diving them or looking for them. But the Mullica wrecks here, Crosswood Creeks are up there. You've seen this map. This is where I've gotten from my association with your organizations, the battle map of all the battles in New Jersey and skirmishes. Chestnut Neck was one of the ones in red, a major battle. There were lots of skirmishes. All of these are minor skirmishes. The red ones are more significant. Crosswood Creek was. Uh, one of my graduate students from MAMA, she wanted to find out about the Crosswood Creek. Uh, and they've been surveyed before. It was a good opportunity to teach her how to use the sonar equipment and do the archaeology to find the shipwreck and to prove that it is that same wreck that was first surveyed back in the early 1980s. So in Bordentown, um, two frigates were in the harbor. They were lodged in different creeks. They were protected from the British who were trying to bail out of Philadelphia throughout all the battles. If you've ever been to uh, Fort Mifflin as you've taken a tour, um, if you haven't been, right by Philadelphia Airport, a great old fort. Major battles that they fought there were pretty amazing. But it was that battle in Washington, covering Washington's retreat, that these ships were 
went into local creeks to hide them from the British who were confiscating everything. So Bordentown, Crossway Creeks are here. The Delaware River, the creeks go up. Go down. <coughs> British tried to hold Philadelphia. They occupied it. They couldn't hold it. There was too much from all of Washington's forces. So eventually they bailed from it. This is a map of Fort Mifflin. When you get there, we were there on a tour. I don't know, maybe. When was the last time Biden was in Philadelphia? We were in a strike or something. We were standing in the fort, and Air Force One flew right over. And I'm thinking, oh, there's my chance. <laughs> <laughs> No secret service around you. Uh, but Fort Mifflin played a role in what well, they recovered Washington's retreat, but at the same time, it forced colonial forces to take their assets and hide them from the British who were looking to take theirs. So. Crosswood Creeks, they had 22 vessels there. They were trapped in the upper Delaware in 1777. Um, the wrecks were worked on by a friend of mine over the years. He was really into this kind of history, and he was the first to do the initial work, and the application was two or three pages back in the 1980s to do a National Register of Nomination. Now it's 50 to 60 pages with so much information. It's almost too difficult to do. But being on the National Register means that they're totally protected from anybody taking things as long as they get caught. But there are plenty of people who like the scuba divers, who want a souvenir. I mean, how many people would be in trouble if they went to Gettysburg with a shovel looking for our It's the same concept. You put them on the National Register, it protects their heritage, protects our heritage. So site three is the place where these wrecks are. You see the, the Google Earth map on the right, the area of the river, and how the river kind of goes. It's really shallow at low tide. If you go there, you can walk out and see some of the timber sticking out of the mud. At high tide, we can get a boat in there and do the sonar images. Which are these? This was uh, Jacqueline's uh, master's thesis. She's a social worker at McGuire, a joint base McGuire, but she likes archaeology. She, in her spare time, this is what we were doing. Hard to tell in this image, but by looking at the image on a better photograph, not on a big screen, you can see the individual tops of the frames buried in the mud. You see the outline of what this 19... 80 picture would have shown in the mud at low tide. It's the same wreck that's same kind of wreck that's in the Mullica River. These are just some of the ships that were hidden in Crossroad Creek, right under Napoleon Bonaparte's brother's house, the second biggest house in the United States next to which one's the biggest house in the United States? Winchester. Huh? No more. I said Winchester. Actually, the biggest residential house. I should change that. Yeah, it's a big white one, DC. Yeah. <laughs> white House is the biggest. But Bonaparte's house was the second biggest thing. It's a tourist attraction, just like everything else. Better picture of the blow up site that Jacqueline's thesis was on. Her job was to map and identify the targets. There are two wrecks there. We can't see where the second one is, although we think we might have found maybe perhaps a third one, or maybe it's just the second one. Uh, but by preserving the location, it still brings that history into relevance. This was what people did, your families, your relatives, to protect the assets for the Continental Congress. So we're doing this kind of presentation Friday in Trenton for 15 minutes. And what we kind of want to convince everybody to do is to uh, start recognizing the fact that these battles on the water were historic. I want to see a sign on the bridge going over the Mullica River, DOT sign, <coughs> historic battle of Chestnut Map. Those are the kind of things that I want. This history, the reason I pursue the history is ask 
most of the people in New Jersey may well have never heard of chestnut. Right. And when I first was asked to go dive, my first response was, where the hell is the mullet grill? <laughs> and now I've made it my academic work to try and get people to actually know of this battle. I want the state of New Jersey. You can't imagine the difficulty it is to reach somebody who makes a decision to put a sign up that just says, here was the battle of Chestnut Hill. That's where your organizations have a lot of weight. That's the way I think we should do something for 2026, the 250th anniversary of the Revolutionary War. You know, this was from the US Merchant Marine Archives when you start looking into the history. Over 14,000 guns on 1,200 privateers during the Revolutionary War. There were 64 US Navy vessels. They were never going to compete with the British. But imagine 1,200 privateers, annoying little mosquitoes or greenheads on the ocean, could come out of Little Egg Harbor in a heartbeat, steal a ship and bring it back in before they even knew it was done. And if you were working on a merchant ship and a boat came up with a couple of cannons, you're not going to fight. Yeah, I surrender. Didn't work out that way for U.S. sailors. They usually wound up on the brig Jersey in New York Harbor, mm -hmm. one of the worst prisons ever. But the battle map, which was done by Sons of the American Revolution, listed all the bats, daughters of the American Revolution, is the main information for all the battles. I've always been a scuba diver. I want the history. <coughs> Um, so part of it is doing presentations, telling people about the battle, telling them why it's important, even though most of the people who drive their boats really fast on the Malacca, the guys who are fishing, crabbing, um, they know the wrecks are there. That's the history that all this stuff is trying to do, a simple sign. How many people passed the monuments that you've erected for the people of the battle because they're in a hurry to get on or off the parkway? You know, so this is a way to tell people, direct them to those sites to get to see the history of the battle. And for the, I saw the emails that you had for some of your members. You know, I see that in my lifetime. So all the people who are dying, one of my friends who was the first guy to dive to the deepest part of the ocean, Don Walsh, died a few days ago. And so the first man to dive in a submersible six miles underwater, pretty cool. Kind of thing that I wish I could do. Uh, any questions? I'm done. I can thank this mentioned that my ancestor, John Van Zandt, I saw an article where two of his ships were at the neck and were burnt, burnt by the bridges. A third ship, he managed to get, a little, get it out and kind of went uh, away first. And you have some documentation on that would be useful? I have a, a letter from one of the relatives that was not in the 1800s talking, talking about their, 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 their ancestor. This is, the, this is the part where all of you have key roles. Think of all the documents you own from your family. They're not in the archives to grab hold of. So how much of that history, how much of the homes along the Mullica have the artifacts from those ships over the last 245 years, 44 years, have wound up in people's mantles and bookcases for the people who could walk out at low tide to the Kramer wreck and just pick up stuff? because at a dead low or storm tides, you could walk out there. The full wreck a little bit harder, the bead wreck, I mean, I could stand on, almost be on my head above water when it was in eight feet of water. Now it's gonna fall back into that 60 foot hole, be gone. At least at the bottom of the hole, it will be there, but it'll be just pieces of wood. It won't be the history. So it doesn't mean as much. So reminding people these kind of talks the students who take my underwater heritage class so that they understand that where we came from were from these rivers. Steve, what, what's next as far as archaeology on the river? We want to try and find the other missing ships. That's the hard part. 
and it usually means finding a piece of equipment, a sub-bottom profiler that can look 30 or 40 feet down and find something that might be buried in the mud. But it will just tell me that there's something there. It's impossible to dig through that. And we're looking, as I told you, looking for a Civil War prototype submarine in Rancocas Creek this weekend. And it's 150 feet back from the creek in a muddy marsh buried since 1846. So I'm not even sure it's there. The only way to prove it is to bring some equipment in. And it's like soggy marsh. I'm not going to walk that far and get stuck in the middle of it. And there's no way out. So we're trying to figure out how to find that. This stuff in the river is trying to identify where everything is to find some way to put it on a website or a sign somewhere to let people know one of the pivotal battles in your early American history was fought here. I mean, people still think the revolution was 1776 when they signed the <laughs> Constitution. They don't even know that the British didn't leave until 1783. And like us in Afghanistan, it just costs too much money. They just retire of it. We're done. It's yours. Let's see what you can do with it. We did pretty good. Up until now, it seems. <laughs> Any other questions? If you have documents, if you would Xerox a copy for me, that would be great. I can't get to your archives, not legally. But if you have letters that help with all this identification, that'd be great. Think of what your family could have written down, the names of the ships, maybe the locations where they were. Right now, people emailing me all the time from other organizations similar to yours. We're looking for the Venus of London, the most famous of all the ships. Wouldn't it be great to put a name on one of those? But how do you know that it's there? They wanted to sell the boat. They wanted to sell these ships, too. But the British came in and burned them. The irony is that the British burned their own ships. You know, so like, huh, yeah, they're big and tough, but they're yours. Uh, but it stopped for a while, but it was too big a business. And the privateers were back in business a month later. Rich came down, yep, flexed their muscles. They lost a couple of ships. They killed a lot of your ancestors. But they didn't get anything in return. The privateers were still there. And that war of attrition is how we still fight wars. I mean, look at what's going on in Gaza and all those places. It's about supplies. It's about the attrition, unfortunately, of people. But all the supplies that go with when you run out of bullets, it's guns, knives, and sticks. So all of this is relevant to our current history. It's just the part of history that most people don't take the time to learn, except you. And most of the time, when I tell my students, really? They're that old? <laughs> yeah, almost as old as I am, right? <laughs> so any other questions? So there's nothing in the zebra that's been found. No, we're not even sure where they blew it up. If I looked at that old map, where would they have put it? It was a brand new warship, so it was something they really wanted to protect. So, so how do you think that the story circulated that the zebra was found? Is that just people wishful thinking? They'd see your racks and then they'd say... I haven't seen any evidence. I, people said, I think I know where it is. I said, well, according to the history, they burned it and set off their powder magazines. That would mean that there's nothing but driftwood. And I haven't had, I have the time, but Stockton won't let me have the boat to side scan the entire bay. It just takes too long to figure out. And, and the times, that you, if you've been through the bay, the channel changes. And Stockton's boat with all the electronics on it has a five foot keel. And there are times where we have to wait for the tide to come up a little bit so we can get off the spots that we didn't pay attention to. So it's going to be hard to figure out where all those things were. The ball corrects were easy. Some of my friends did the initial work on them when we were diving them as scuba divers, saying, hey, this is cool, we're diving a wreck from the Revolutionary War. Now that I'm trained to do the archaeology, where are all the other ships? How can we totally define the battle? And document it with a book. You know, the book that's floating around here is like $85. Not the kind of thing people are going to buy. 
but it's going to go into the archive for a lot of different universities who will do the kind of research. And like everything else, one little bit of information leads to another. When you're looking up heritage, somebody tells you a story, you move on to another person, you get other information before you build a complete picture of what people you knew or things that they did came from. And the same thing with us, we're just looking for more. So whatever you think you have, you know, don't send me the original document. I might be, don't, don't want that responsibility. But a photocopy or a picture would be great. Because you own history, and unless you share it, what good is it except for your families? Yeah. You know, so that could be the next chapter in the next book. I mean, the Cantrells got their wooden keel in the book. The anchor was part of the efforts for some of your members who helped us do that. That's the kind of involvement in history that I'm trying to do all the time. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you.